welcome to Sleepy Tom Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve well rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we get on with the rest of the show, I'd like to take a couple of minutes of your time and ask for some support. This show is brought to you by supporters on Patreon. I'm hearing from more people all the time how valuable they find the show, and those supporters who have the means to help fund it, to keep it going, and help me to reach new audiences are very much appreciated. I also have to be completely honest in that I work in the hospitality industry, and obviously that has been very hit very hard by the pandemic. I'm a short time at work and stressing a bit about money, so I'd appreciate some support to help make ends meet, and ultimately to transform to doing this full-time. I'd love to be free of working from others and working for others and take sleepy time tales to the next level. I'd like to do more episodes and take more time on story selection and writing original stuff that I just can't, can't, don't have the time for right now. So if you're making use of sleepy time tales regularly to help you to deal with sleeplessness and you have the urge to support the show and most importantly if you have the means please check out patreon.com slash sleepytimetales, go to the link in the show notes or from the website, to take a look at the options. You'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you're contributing to the rest and lifestyle improvement of thousands of people. And over and above that, there are real rewards from as little as $2 a month, from early release to weekly bonus episodes and special edits of the main show. In fact, starting in the beginning of February, I'm going to introduce a fun new reward at the $5 level. That's a monthly Megasode. $5 listeners already get the weekly Minisode. But I'm going to combine all the stories and Minisodes from the, the previous month into one long episode that will probably run in the region of about five hours. It'll only have the one intro, one outro. But overall, if you want something that runs through a large chunk of the night and possibly even to when you wake up in the middle of the night um there's an option for you i'd like to thank patron mario for the suggestion which i really did take a liking to i'm going to try and go back and do some older ones as well for previous months but um going forward that's definitely going to be a thing so yeah sign up at five dollars or upgrade your membership to get access to that along with existing bonuses And of course, speaking of patrons, I need to shout out new patrons Felicity and Chris, who are helping me out very much in this tough time, and helping me to keep Sleepy Time Tales running and available for free to thousands of listeners every month. I also signed up recently to a new service called Buy Me A Coffee, so if you'd like to make a one-self contribution without having to sign up for any new accounts, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash sleepytimetales. There's also a button on the website and a link in the show notes to that. And a while ago I got a suggestion to do some personal stories for people, so I thought I'd give that a try. If you have a personal favorite story, or you think someone would appreciate the gift of a personal favorite story that they would like to listen to at bedtime, drop me a mail at contact at sleepytimetales.net. These recordings will be strictly for personal use, so they can even use something current that you own a copy of. Take advantage of exchange rates and I'll give you a very competitive price that will be fair and useful to me as well. But while I've gone on about nearly four minutes about money, another huge way you can help is to simply spread the word. If there is someone else in your life who you think will benefit from listening to Sleepy Time Tales, just let them know. If you recommend the show on social media, please make sure to tag me in so that I know and I can thank you. That's it at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter. And of course, as usual, I need to shout out the music, which is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiko. The music is available on their website at loyaltyfreakmusic.com, and I've linked the website in the show notes as they've got some very cool stuff released under various names that I do 
definitely recommend you check out. So thank you for taking the time and let's get back to the story. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? What is this strange idea, this podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to? But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century and this is a podcast that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, mind spinning and emotions in turmoil with the anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off again at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Now, every episode of Sleepy Time Tales starts with this long intro, which usually goes on for roughly 15 minutes. It has a couple of very important purposes. First up, I need to explain the structure and purpose of the show to new listeners. I need to sort of make the case for it and explain why I think it'll help you. I need to persuade you to be patient if it doesn't pay off immediately and make you feel like you can trust me to drone in your ear while you're trying to sleep. For all the listeners, it has a different but also extremely important purpose. For them, this is the time for them to get ready to sleep, to prepare their space and themselves, because we're trying to build a space here together. So for them, this is when you put the podcast on and let it run in the background while they brush their teeth and grab a drink of water, make sure the room isn't too hot, snuggle down in their blankets after puffing up their pillows, and start getting their mindset ready so that by the time the story comes, you're already part way there. In fact, the highest praise I can receive for Four Sleepy Time Tales is to have someone reach out and tell me that they're asleep before we even get to the story. Because really, Sleepy Time Tales isn't about the story. The story is me keeping you company while you struggle to sleep, but the story isn't the point. This isn't an audiobook. I do sometimes get complaints about the intro, but this intro that goes on is usually pretty much the same, but not always quite the same, is actually the meat of the show. This is the part where we create new habits. This is your chance to replace bad sleep hygiene. This is what happens here. This is where I go on and on and I help to get you into a restful mindset before we even get to the story. Initially, Sleepy Time Tales is intended to be used as a distraction to what keeps you awake at night. To keep your mind focused on something while sleep comes for you. But for some people, it may be something different. It may be just background noise or company. And that's why I make the episodes quite long. So that I'm here for you without uh, feeling any pressure of running out of time and reaching the end of the episode. Because often insomnia and sleeplessness come from the stresses of niggles of our waking life, the things that poke away at our brain as the night gets dark and we try to sleep. Different people find different things helpful and sometimes for different reasons. As I say, the primary aim with this podcast is that I'm here to distract you to share a story, boringly told, that keeps the doubts and stresses at bay long enough for sleep to come for you. Now as far as I know, there's a couple of different ways to engage with the show. For me, I need something to focus on. A story or an event that lets me keep my mind on a specific point, to stop it from spinning out into stresses and anxieties, to focus just enough not to resist the embrace of a night's sleep when it comes for me. Some people might need something a bit different. Just some kind of background, some kind of white noise. Maybe some people just need a droning male voice, like some people need the sound of the sea or the rain. For tonight's story, we return to The Man Between, an international romance by Amelia E. Barr. It's been a long time since I did the first part of the story, so um, most people probably won't have remembered what's going on. It's a sort of high society romance, young women of uh, noble means and their romances and things that they want to go on. Kind of cute and charming in many ways and quite um, interesting characters. Quite a fascinating little story actually and I do actually do recommend it. It's got a, a real charm to it. But really the story doesn't matter. Uh, whatever it is, I'll be droning on and 
being boring in the background. So what is key is that you don't try to fall asleep. Just keep a light mental grip on the story as I tell it and allow the need for sleep to come for you. Now obviously if all goes well I'm hoping you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it's important that you don't feel pressurized. It may not work on your first night. It might take a few nights for you to get used to listening to my voice. Maybe my accent is strange to you. Maybe one episode just isn't long enough. Or maybe your problem isn't actually the going to sleep. Maybe your problem is waking up in the middle of the night. What I recommend, because it's what works for me, is to just let the podcast run all night. I download at least a night's worth of episodes of the shows that I listen to, and then I'll put them on a playlist, and I'll start with the latest, and I'll let them go all night. Long enough so that they're always going to be there, because if the stream is still running and I find myself waking up at 3am, I can just pop my earbuds in and go straight back to sleep again. Sometimes I even wake up 30 minutes or 60 minutes before my alarm goes, and what I do in that case is the exact same thing. I carry on listening, and it knocks me right back out. And that may sound strange, may seem a little bit pointless. What good is an extra 30 minutes or 60 minutes of sleep? And I've got to tell you that that can be the most restful part of my night. There is something about allowing yourself to relax completely right before the alarm that is just satisfying on a whole new deep level. But it's very important that whether you're trying to go to sleep or try and go back to sleep, it's very important that you try to relax. If you're new to the show and to sleep casts in general and sleepy time tales in particular, and pro to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, this may seem strange to you. So give it a chance. In fact, I usually recommend that people try give it at least two, preferably three nights to give it a solid go, see if it works for them. Got to sort of get over that resistance and try to create these new habits that uh, are really so key. And that's the basic idea. You relax and you lie in the dark, and while you do that, I'll tell you a tale. So relax, dear listener. My nighttime friend has elected to lie in the dark, listening to my voice. You will always be safe with me, because I'm here to help you relax, to improve your life in a small way, or maybe not so small. Because people don't sleep very well these days, and it makes their lives harder. So I'm here to do my small part to help you in a big way. To help you to face tomorrow and the day after, well rested and better able to cope. I believe very strongly in the benefits of kindness. I want to be kind to you. I want to share kindness with you. And I need you to be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up or rebuke yourself over not sleeping. Don't get tense if you just can't get yourself over the edge of sleep, even with me here in your ears trying to help. Frustration is one of the great enemies of a good night's sleep, and the intention with this podcast is to short-circuit that frustration, to distract the feeling we get when we blame ourselves for not being able to let go and drift into the dark. So take a breath. Forgive the fact you can't sleep, and let my voice wash over you. Take another breath. Imagine the warm darkness rising up, inviting you to sleep and to a better life starting tomorrow. And if you can't let go, forgive yourself and we'll try again tomorrow. If you've had a laugh of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy. But it's not your enemy. It's a natural process that we've been pulled away from by stress and life and progress that shines bright lights in our eyes at all hours. I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream.
The Man Between, An International Romance by Amelia E. Barr Chapter 2 During dinner, both Ruth and Ethel were aware of some sub-interest in the judge's manner. His absent-mindedness was unusual, and once Ruth saw a faint smile that nothing evident could have induced. Unconsciously, he also set a tone of constraint and hurry. The meal was not loitered over, the conversation flagged, and all rose from the table with a sense of relief, perhaps indeed with a feeling of expectation. They entered the parlour together and the master froze to meet them, asking permission to remain with the little coaxing push of his nose, which brought the ready answer. Certainly, Sultan, make yourself comfortable. Then they grouped themselves around the fire, and the judge lit his cigar and looked at Ethel in a way that instantly brought curiosity to the question. You have a secret, father, she said. Is it about grandmother? It is news rather than a secret, Ethel, and grandmother has a good deal to do with it, for it is about her family, the Mostons. Oh. The tone of Ethel's, oh, was not encouraging and Ruth's look of interest held in abeyance was just as chilling. But something like this attitude had been expected, and Judge Rawdon was not discouraged by it. He knew that youth is capable of great and sudden changes, and that its ability to find reasonable motives for them is unlimited. So he calmly continued. You are aware that your grandmother's name before marriage was Rachel Mostyn. I have seen it a thousand times at the bottom of her sampler, father the one that is framed and hanging in her morning room. Rachel Mostyn, November, Anna Domini, 1827. Very well. She married George Rawdon and they came to New York in 1834. They had a pretty house on the Bowling Green and lived very happily there. I was born in 1850, the youngest of their children. You know that I signed my name Edward M. Rawdon. It is really Edwin Mostyn Rawdon. He paused, and Ruth said, I suppose Mrs. Rawdon has had some news from her old home. She had a letter last night, and I shall probably receive one tomorrow. Frederick Mostyn, her grandnephew, is coming to New York, and Squire Rawdon of Rawdon Manor writes to recommend the young man to our hospitality. But you surely do not intend to invite him here, Edward. I think that would not do. He is going to the Holland House, but he is our kinsman, and therefore we must be hospitable. I have been trying to count the kinship. It is out of my reckoning, said Ethel. I hope at least he is nice and presentable. The Mostons are a handsome family. Look at your grandmother. And Squire Rawdon speaks very well of Mr. Moston. He has taken the right side in politics and is likely to make his mark. They were always great sportsmen, and I dare say this representative of the family is a good-looking fellow, well-mannered and perfectly dressed. Ethel laughed. If his clothes fit him, he will be an English wonder. I've seen loads of Englishmen. They're all frights to trousers and vests. Those Lord Wycombe, his broads and satins and linen were marvels in quality, but the make. The girls hated to be seen walking with him, and he would walk... Good for the constitution, was his explanation, for all his peculiarities. The Kalers were weary to death of them. And yet, said Ruth, they sang songs of triumph when Lou Keller married him. That was a different thing. Lou would make him get fits and stop wearing sloppy, baggy arrangements. And I do not suppose the English lord now has a single peculiarity left, unless it be his constitutional walk. Dad, of course. I have heard English babies get out of their cradles to take a constitutional. During this tirade, Ruth had been thinking. Edward, she asked. Why does Squire Rawdon introduce Mr. Mostyn? The relationship cannot be worth counting. There you are wrong, Ruth. He spoke with a little excitement. Englishmen never deny matrimonial relationships, if they are worthy ones. Mostyn and Rawdon are bound together by many a gold wedding ring. We reckon such Tars relationships. Squire Rawdon lost his son and his two grandsons a year ago. Perhaps this young man may eventually stand in their place. 
The squire is nearly eighty years old. He is the last of the English wardens, at least of our branch of it. You suppose this Mr. Moston may become squire of Rawdon Manor? He may, Ruth, but it is not certain. There is a large mortgage on the manor. Oh. Both girls made the ejaculation at the same moment, and in both voices there was the same curious tone of speculation. It was a cry after truth apprehended and but not realised. Mr. Rawdon remained silent. He was debating with himself the advisability of further confidence, but he came quickly to the conclusion that enough had been told for the present. Turning to Ethel, he said, I suppose girls have a code of honour about their secrets. Is Dora Dennings' extraordinary news shut up in it? Oh no, father, she's going to be married, that's all. That is enough. Who is the man? Reverend Mr. Stanhope. Nonsense. Positively. I never heard anything more ridiculous. That saintly young priest? Why, Dora will be tired to death of him in a month. And he? Poor fellow. My poor fellow, he is very much in love with her. It is hard to understand. St. Jerome's love, pale with midnight prayer, would be more believable than the butterfly Dora. Goodness gracious. The idea of that man being in love. It pulls him down a bit. I thought he never looked at a woman. Do you know him, father? As many people know him, by good report. I know that he is a clergyman who believes what he preaches. I know a Wall Street broker who left St. Jude's Church because Mr. Stanhope's sermons on Sunday put such a fine edge on his conscience that Mondays were dangerous days for him to do business on. And whatever Wall Street financiers think of the Bible personally, they do like a man who sticks to his colours and who holds intact the truth committed to him. Stanhope does this emphatically, and he is so well trusted that if he wanted to build a new church, he could get all the money necessary from Wall Street men in an hour. And he's going to marry... Going to marry Dora Denning. It is extraordinary news indeed. Ethel was a little offended at such an unusual surprise. I think you don't quite understand Dora, she said. It'll be Mr. Stanhope's fault if she is not led in the right way. For if he only loves and pets her enough, he may do all she wishes with her. I both coaxed and ordered her for four years. Sometimes one way is best and sometimes the other. How is a man to tell which way to take? What do her parents think of the marriage? They are pleased with it. Pleased with it? Then I have nothing more to say, except that I hope they will not appeal to me on any question of divorce that may arise from such an unlikely marriage. They are only lovers yet, Edward, said Ruth. It is not fair or kind to even think of divorce. My dear Ruth, the fashionable girl of today accepts marriage with a provision of divorce. Dora is hardly one of that set. I hope she may keep out of it, but marriage will give her many opportunities. Well, I'm sorry for the young priest. He isn't fit to manage a woman like Dora Denning. I'm afraid he will get the worst of it. I think you are very unkind, father. Dora is my friend and I know her. She's a girl of intense feelings and very affectionate and she has dissolved all her life and mind in Mr. Stanhope's life and mind, just as a lump of sugar is dissolved in water. Ruth laughed. Can you not find a more poetic simile, Ethel? It will do. This is an age of matter. A material symbol is the proper thing. I'm glad to hear she has dissolved her mind in Stanhope's, said Judge Rawdon. Dora's intellect in itself is childish. What did the man see in her that he should desire her? Father, you never can tell how much brains men like with their beauty. Very little will do generally. And Dora has beauty. Great beauty. No one can deny that. I think Dora is giving up a great deal. To her, at least, marriage is a state of passing from perfect freedom into the comparative condition of a slave, giving up her own way constantly for someone else's way. Well, Ethel, the remedy is in the lady's hands. She is not forced to marry, and the slavery that is voluntary is no hardship. Now, my dear, I have a case to look over, and you must excuse me tonight. 
Tomorrow we shall know more concerning Mr. Marston, and it is easier to talk about certainties than probabilities. But of conversation ceased about Mr. Marston, thought did not. For a couple of hours afterwards, Ethel tapped at her aunt's door and said, Just a moment, Ruth. Yes, dear, what is it? Did you notice what father said about the mortgage on Rawdon Manor? Yes. He seemed to know all about it. I think he does know all about it. Do you think he holds it? He may do so. It's not unlikely. Oh, then Mr. Fred Mostyn, if he is to inherit Rawdon, would like the mortgage removed. Of course he would. And the way to remove it would be to marry the daughter of the holder of the mortgage. It would be one way. So he's coming to look me over. I'm a matrimonial possibility. How do you like that idea, Aunt Ruth? I do not entertain it for a moment. Mr. Mostyn may not even know of the mortgage. When men mortgage their estates, they do not make confidences about the matter, or talk it over with their friends. They always conceal and hide the transaction. If your father holds the mortgage, I feel sure that no one but himself and Squire Rawdon know anything about it. Don't look at the wrong side of events, Ethel. Be content with the right side of life's tapestry. Why are you not asleep? What are you worrying about? Nothing. I only have not heard all I wanted to hear. And perhaps that is good for you. I shall go and see Grandmother first thing in the morning. I would not if I were you. You cannot make any excuse you will not see through. Your father will call on Mr. Mostyn tomorrow and we shall get unprejudiced information. Oh, I don't know that, Ruth. Father is intensely American, 364 days and 23 hours in a year. And in an odd hour he will flare up Yorkshire like a conflagration. English, you mean? No, Yorkshire is England to grandmother and father. They don't think anything much of the other counties, and people from them are just respectable foreigners. You may depend on it. Whatever grandmother says of Mr. Fred Mostyn, father will believe it too. Your father always believes whatever your grandmother says. Good night, dear. Good night. I think I shall go to grandmother in the morning. I know how to manage her. I shall meet her squarely with the truth and acknowledge that I'm dying with curiosity about Mr. Marston. And she will tease and lecture you and say you're not sweetheart high yet, only a little maid and so on. Far better go and talk with Dora. Tomorrow she will need you, I'm sure. Ethel, I'm very sleepy. Good night again, dear. Good night. Then with sudden animation. I know what to do. I shall tell Grandmother about Dora's marriage. That's all plain enough now. Good night, Ruth. And this good night, though dropping sweetly into the minor third, had yet on its final inflection something of the pleasant hopefulness of its main major key. It expressed anticipation and satisfaction. What happened in the night session she could not tell, but she awoke with a positive disinclination to ask a question about Mr. Marston. I have received orders from someone, she said to Ruth. I simply do not care whether I ever see or hear of the man again. I am going to Dora, and I may not come home till late. You know they will depend upon me for every suggestion. In fact, Ethel did not return home until the following day, for a snowstorm came up in the afternoon, and the girl was weary with planning and writing, and well inclined to eat with Dora the delicate little dinner served to them in Dora's private parlour. Then about nine o'clock Mr. Stanhope called, and Ethel found it pleasant enough to watch the lovers and listen to Mrs. Denning's opinions of what had been already planned. And the next day she seemed to be so absolutely necessary to the movement of marriage preparations that it was nearly dark before she was permitted to return home. It was but a short walk between the two houses, and Ethel was resolved to have the refreshment of the exercise and how good it was to feel the pinch of the frost and the gust of the north wind, and after it to come into the happy portal of home and the familiar atmosphere of the cheerful hall, and then to peep into the firelit room in which Luth lay dreaming in the dusky shadows. Ruth, darling. Ethel, 
I was just saying for you to come home. Then she rose and took Ethel in her arms. How delightfully cold you are. And what rosy cheeks. Do you know that we have a little dinner party? Mr. Marston? Yes, and your grandmother, and perhaps Dr. Fisher. The doctor is not certain. And I see that you're already addressed. How handsome you look. That black lace with the dull gold ornaments is all right. I felt as if Jules would be overdressed for family dinner. Yes, but Jules always snub men so completely. It is not altogether that they represent money. They give an air of royalty, and a woman without jewels is like an uncrowned queen. She does not get the homage. I can't account for it, but there it is. I shall wear my sapphire necklace. What did father say about a new kinsman? Very little. It was impossible to judge from his words what he thought. I fancy that he might have been a little disappointed. I should not wonder. We shall see. You will be dressed in an hour? In less time. Shall I wear blue or white? Pale blue and white flowers. There are some white violets in the library. I have a red rose. We shall contrast each other very well. What is it all about? Do we really care how we look in the eyes of this Mr. Moston? Of course we care. We should not be women if we did not care. We must make some sort of an impression, and naturally we prefer it that it would be a pleasant one. If we consider the mortgage... Nonsense. The mortgage is not in it. Goodbye. Tell Matty to bring me a cup of tea upstairs. I will be dressed in an hour. The tea was brought and drank, and Ethel fell asleep while her maid prepared every item for her toilet. Then she spoke to her mistress, and Ethel awakened, as she always did, with a smile. Nature's sure a sign of erratically sweet temper. And everything went in accord with a smile. Her hair fell naturally into its most becoming waves, her dress into its most graceful folds. The sapphire necklace matched the blue of her happy eyes, the rose of youth were on her cheeks, and white violets on her breast. She felt her own beauty and was glad of it and with a laughing word of pleasure went down to the parlour. Madame Rawdon was standing before the fire, but when she heard the door open, she turned her face toward it. Come here, Ethel Rawdon, she said, and let me have a look at you. And Ethel went to her side, laid her hand lightly on the old lady's shoulder, and kissed her cheek. You do look middling well, she continued, and your dress is about as it should be. I like a girl to dress like a girl. Still, the sapphires? Are they necessary? You would not say corals, would you, grandmother? I have those you gave me when I was three years old. Keep your wit, my dear, for this evening. I should not wonder, but you might need it. Fred Moston is rather better than I expected. It was a great pleasure to see him. It was like a bit of my own youth back again. When you are a very old woman, there are few things sweeter, Ethel. But you're not an old woman, Grandmother. Nor was she. In spite of her seventy-five years, she stood erect at the side of her granddaughter. Her abundant hair was partly grey, but the grey mingled with the little oval of costly lace that lay upon it, and the effect was soft and fair as powdering. She had been very handsome, and her beauty lingered as the beauty of some flowers linger, its fainter tints and less firm outlines for she had never fallen from that grace of God vouchsafed to children, and therefore she had kept not only the enthusiasms of her youth, but that sweet promise of the times of restitution, when the child shall die one hundred years old, because the child heart shall be kept in all its freshness and trust. Yes, in Rachel Rawdon's heart, the wellsprings of love and life lay too deep for the frosts of age to touch. She would be eternally young before she grew old. She sat down as Ethel spoke and drew the girl to her side. I hear your friend is going to marry, she said. Dora? Yes. Are you sorry? Perhaps not. Dora's been a care to me for four years. I hope her husband may manage her as well as I have done. Are you afraid he will not? I cannot tell, Grandmother. I see all Dora's faults. 
Mrs. Stanhope is certain that she has no faults. Hitherto she has had her own way in everything. Excepting myself, no one has ventured to contradict her. But then Dora is over head and ears in love, and love, it is said, makes all things easy to bear and to do. One thing, girls, amazes me. It is how readily women go to church and promise to love, honour and obey their husbands when they never intend to do anything of the kind. There is a still a more amazing thing, madam, answered Ruth. That is that men should be so foolish as to think, or hope, they might perhaps do so. Old-fashioned women used to manage it some way or the other, Ruth. But the old-fashioned woman was a very soft-hearted creature, and maybe it was just as well that she was. But women's dark ages are nearly over, madam, and is not the new woman a great improvement on the old woman? I haven't made up my mind yet, Ruth, about the new woman. I notice one thing that a few of the kind have got into their pretty heads, and that is they ought to have been men. And they have followed up that idea so far that there's now very little difference in their looks, and still less in their walk. They go stamping along with the step of an athlete, and the stride of a peasant on a fresh ploughed fields. It is the most hideous of walks imaginable. The Grecian bend, which you cannot remember, but may have heard of, was a lackadaisical, vulgar walking fad. But it was grace itself compared with the hideous stride which the new woman has acquired on the golf links or somewhere else. But men stamp and stride in the same way, grandmother. A long stride suits a man's anatomy well enough. It does not suit a woman's. She feels every stride she takes, I'll warrant her. If she plays golf... My dear Ethel, there is no need for her to play golf. It is a man's game and was played for centuries by men only. In Scotland, the home of golf, it is not thought nice for women to even go near the links because of the awful language they were likely to hear. Then, Grandmother, is it not well for ladies to play golf if it keeps men from using awful language to each other? God love you, child. Men will think what they dare not speak. If we could only have some new men, sighed Ethel. The lover of today is just what a girl can pick up. He has no wit to know wisdom and no illusions. He talks of his muscles and smells of cigarettes. Perhaps whiskey. And at these words, Judge Rawdon, accompanied by Mr. Fred Moston, entered the room. The introduction slipped over easily. That hardly seemed to be necessary. And the young man took the chair offered as naturally as if he had sat by the hearth all of his life. There was no pause and no embarrassment and no useless polite platitudes. And Ethel's first feeling about her kinsman was one of her admiration, for the perfect ease and almost instinctive at-homeness with which he took his place. He had come to his own and his own had received him. That was the situation, a very pleasant one, which he accepted with a smiling trust that was once the most perfect and polite of acknowledgments. So you do not enjoy travelling, said Judge Rawdon, as if continuing a conversation. I think it is the most painful way of taking pleasure, sir. That is the actual transit. And sleeping cars and electric lighted steamers and hotels do not mitigate the suffering. If Dante was writing now, he might depict a constant round of personally conducted tours in purgatory. I should think the punishment adequate for any offence. But I like arriving at places. New York has given me a lot of new sensations today and I have forgotten the transit troubles already. He talked well and temperately, and yet Ethel could not avoid the conclusion that he was a man of positive character and uncompromising prejudices. And she felt also a little disappointed in his personality, which contradicted her ideal of a Yorkshire squire. For he was small and slender in stature, and his face was keen and thin, from the high cheekbones to the sharp point of the clean-shaven chin. Yet it was an interesting face, for the brows were broad and the eyes were bright and glancing. That his nature held the opposite of his qualities was evident from the mouth, which was composed and discreet and generally clothed with a frank smile, negatived by the deep sonorous voice which belongs to the indiscreet and quarrelsome. His dress was perfect, 
Ethel could find no fault in it, except the monocle which she did not use once during the evening, and which she therefore decided was a quite idle and unhandsome adjunct. One feature of his character was definite. He was a home-loving man. He liked the society of women with whom he could be familiar, and he was preferred the book company of books and music to fashionable social functions. This pleasant habit of domesticity was illustrated during the evening by an accidental incident. A noisy mechanical street organ stopped before the windows, and in a blatant manner began its performance. Conversation was paralyzed by the intrusion, and when it was removed, Judge Rawdon said, what a democratic, leveling, aggressive thing music is. It insists on being heard. It is always in the way. It thrusts itself upon you, whether you want it to or not. Now art is different. You go to see pictures when you wish to. Mustin did not notice the criticism on music itself, but added in a soft, disapproving way. That man has no music in him. Do you know that was one of Mendelssohn's delicious dreams? This is how it should have been rendered. And he went impulsively to the piano, and then the sweet monotonous cadences and melodious reveries slipped from his long white fingers, till the whole room was permeated with the delicious sense of moonlit solitude, and conversation was stilled in its languor. The young man had played his own dismissal, but it was an effective one and he complimented himself on his readiness to seize opportunities for display, and on his genius in satisfying them. I think I astonished them a little, he mused, and I wonder what the pretty cousin of mine thought of the music and the musician. I fancy we shall be good friends. She is proud, that is no fault, and she has very decided opinions, which might be a great fault, but I think I rather astonished them. To such reflections, he stepped rather pompously down the avenue, not at all influenced by any premonition that his satisfactory feelings might be imperfectly shared. Yet silence was the first result of his departure. Judge Rawdon took out his pocketbook and began to study its entries. Ruth Bayard rose and closed the piano. Ethel lifted a magazine, while it was Madame who finally asked in an impatient tone, What do you think of Frederick? I suppose, Edward, you have an opinion. Isn't he a very clever man? I should not wonder if he were, mother, clever to a fault. I never heard a young man talk better. He talked a great deal, but then you know that was not on his oath. I'll warrant every word he said. You warrant his fine surety, mother, but I'm not bound to believe all I hear. You women can please yourselves. And with these words he left the woman to find out if they could, what manner of man their newly found kinsman might be. Chapter 3 One of the most comfortable things about Frederick Mostyn was his almost boyish delight in the new life which New York opened to him. Every phase of it was so fresh, so unusual, that his Yorkshire existence at Mostyn Hall gave him no precedence, and no experiences by which to measure events. The simplest things were surprising or interesting. He was never weary of taking these exciting lifts to the top of 23-story buildings and admiring the wonderful views such altitudes gave him. He did not perhaps comprehend how much he was influenced by the friction of two million walls and interests, did not realize how they evoked an electric condition that got behind the foreground of existence and stirred something more at the roots of his being than any previous experience had ever done. And this feeling was especially entrancing when he saw the great city and majestic river lying at his feet in the white and canny light of electricity. All its color gone, its breath cold, its life strangely remote and quiet. Men moving like shadows and sounds hollow and faint and far off, as if they came from a distant world. It gave him a sense of dreamland quite as much as that of reality. The auction moors and words grew dull and dreary in his memory. Even the thought of the hunting field could not lure his desire. New York was full of marvellous novelties. Its daily routine, even in the hotel and on the street, gripped his heart and his imagination. And he confessed to himself that New York was life at first hand. Fresh drawn, 
its very foam sparkling and intoxicating. He walked from the park to the battery and examined all that caught his eye. He had a history of the city and sought out every historical site. He even went over to Weehawken and did his best to locate the spot where Burr and Hamilton fought. He admired Hamilton, but after reading all about the two men, he gave his sympathy to Burr. A clever, unlucky little chap, he said. Why do clever men hate each other? And then he smiled queerly as he remembered political enemies of great men in his own day and his own country, and concluded that it was their nature to do so. But in these outside enthusiasms, he did not forget his personal relations. It took him but a few days to domesticate himself in both the Rawdon houses. When the weather drove him off the streets, he found a pleasant refuge either with Madame or with Ethel and Miss Bayard. Ethel he saw less frequently than he liked. She was nearly always with Dora Denning, but with Ruth Bayard he contracted a very pleasant friendship. He told her all his adventures and found her more sympathetic than Madame ever pretended to be. Madame thought him as provincial in his tastes and was better pleased to hear that he had a visiting entry at two good clubs and had hired a motor car and was learning how to manage it. Then she told herself that if he was good to her, she would buy him one to be proud of before he returned to Yorkshire. It was at the elite club Brass Denning first saw him. He came in with Shaw McLaren, a young man whose acquaintance was considered as most definitely satisfactory. Vainly, Brass Denning had striven to obtain any notice whatever from McLaren, whose exclusiveness was proverbial. Who then was the stranger he appeared so anxious to entertain? His look of supreme satisfaction, his hybrid air, and his peculiar intonation quickly satisfied Brass as to his nationality. English, of course, he reflected, and probably one of the aristocrats that Shaw meets at his recently ennobled sister's place. His forever never bragging about them. I must find out who Shaw's last British lion is. And just as he arrived at this decision, the person appeared who could satisfy him. That man was the reply to the inevitable question. Why, he's some relative of the old lady Rawdon. He's staying at the Holland house, but spend his time with the Rawdons, old and young. The young one is a beauty, you know. Do you think so? She's a good deal at our house. I suppose the fellow has some pretensions. Judge Rawdon will be a hard man to satisfy with a son-in-law. I fancy his daughter will take that subject in her own hand. She looks like a girl of spirit. And this man is not as handsome as most Englishmen. Not if you judge him by bulk. But women want more than mere bulk. His name of breeding you can't mistake, and he looks clever. His name is Mostyn. I've heard him spoken of. Would you like to know him? I could live without that honour. Then Brass turned the conversation upon a recent horse sale, and a few moments later was sauntering up the avenue. He was now resolved to make up his quarrel with Dora. Through Dora he could manage to meet Mostyn socially and he smiled in anticipation of that proud moment when he could parade in his own friendly leash McLaren's new British line. Besides introduction to Mr. Mostyn might, if judiciously managed, promote his own acquaintance with Shaw McLaren, a sequence to be much desired, an end he had persistently looked for. He went straight to his sister's apartments and touched the bell quite gently. Her maid opened the door and looked annoyed and uncertain. She knew all about the cruelly wicked opposition of Mrs. Denning's brother to that nice young man, Basil Stanhope, and also the general attitude of the Denning household, which was a comprehensive disapproval of all that Mr. Brass said and did. Dora had, however, talked all her anger away. She wished now to be friends with her brother. She knew that his absence from her wedding would cause unpleasant notice, and she had other reasons, purely selfish all emphasising the advantages of a reconciliation. So she went to meet Brass with a pretty, pathetic air of injury, patiently endured, and when Brass put out his hands and said, Forgive me, Dodo, I cannot bear your anger any longer, she was quite ready for the next act, which was to lay her pretty head on his shoulder and murmur, I'm not angry, Brass, I'm grieved, dear. 
I know, Dodo. Forgive me. That was all my fault. I think I was jealous of you. It was hard to find you loved a stranger better than you loved me. Kiss me and been my own sweet, beautiful sister again. I shall try to like all the people you like, for your sake, you know. Then Dora was charming. She sat and talked and planned and told him all that had been done and all that was yet to do. And Bryce never once named either Ethel or Mr. Moston. He knew Dora was a shrewd little woman and that he would have to be very careful in introducing the subject of Mr. Moston, or else she would be sure to reach the central truth of his submission to her. But somehow things happen for those who are content to leave their desires to contingencies and accidentals. The next morning he breakfasted with the family and felt himself repaid for his concession to Dora by the evident pleasure their renewed affection gave his father and mother. And though the elder Denning made no remark on it, the renewed family solidarity, Bryce anticipated many little favours and accommodations from his father's satisfaction. After breakfast he sat down, lit his cigar and waited. Both his mother and Dora had much to tell him, and he listened and gave them such excellent advice that they were compelled to regret the arrangements already made had lacked the benefits of his counsels. But you had Ethel Rawdon, he said. I thought she was everybody rolled into one. Uh, Ethel doesn't know as much as you think she does, said Mrs. Denning. I don't agree with lots of things she advises. Then take my advice, mother. Oh, Bryce, it is the best of all. Bryce does not know about dresses and such things, mother. Ethel finds out what she does not know. Bryce cannot go to modistes and milliners with me. Well, Ethel does not pay as much attention as she might. She is always going somewhere or other with that Englishman that she says is a relative. For my part, I doubt it. Oh, mother. Girls will say anything, Dora, to hide a love affair. Why does she never bring him here to call? Because I asked her not. I do not want to make new friends, especially English ones now. I am so busy all day, and of course my evenings belong to the Basil. Yes, and there is no one to talk to me. Ethel and the Englishman would pass an hour or two very nicely, and your father is very fond of foreigners. I think you ought to ask Ethel to introduce him to us. Then we could have a little dinner for him and invite him to our opera box. Don't you agree with me, Bryce? If Dora does. Of course, at this time, Dora's wishes and engagements are the most important. I have seen the young man at the club with Shaw McLaren and about town with Judge Rawdon and others. He seems a nice little fellow. Jack Lacey wanted to introduce me to him yesterday, but I told him I'd live without the honour. Of course, if Dora feels like having him here, that is a very different matter. He is certainly distinguished looking and would give an air to the wedding. Is he handsome, Bryce? Yes and no. Women would rave about him. Men would think him finical and dandified. He looks as if he were the happiest fellow in the world. In fact, he looks so provokingly happy that I disliked him. But now that Dodo is my little sister again, I can be happy enough to envy no one. Then Dora slipped her hand into her brother's hand and Bryce knew that he might make his way to the little office in William Street. The advent of Mr. Moston into his life being now as certain as anything in this questionable fluctuating world could be. As he was sauntering down the avenue, he met Ethel, and he turned and walked back with her to the Denning house. He was so good-natured and so good-humoured that Ethel could not avoid an inquisitive look at the usually glum young man, and he caught it with a laugh and said, I suppose you wonder what is the matter with me, Miss Rawdon? You look more than usually happy. If I suppose you found a wife or a fortune, shall I be wrong? You come near the truth. I found a sister. Do you know I'm very fond of Dora and we've made up our quarrel? Then Ethel looked at him again. She did not believe him. She was sure that Dora was not the only evoker of the unbounded satisfaction in Bryce Denning's face and manner. But she let the reason pass. She had no likely arguments to use against it. And that day, Mrs. Denning, with a slight air of injury, opened the subject of Mr. Moston's introduction to them. She thought Ethel had hardly treated the Dennings fairly. Everyone was wondering what that they had not met him. 
Of course, she knew they were not aristocrats, and she supposed Erethel was ashamed of them. But for her part, she thought they were good as most people. And if it came to money, they could put down dollar for dollar with any multimillionaire in America, or England either, for that matter. When her approach took this tone, there seemed to be the only thing for Ethel to say or do. But that one thing was exactly what she did not say or do. She took up Mrs. Denning's reproach and complained that her relative and friend had been purposely and definitely ignored. Dora had told her plainly she did not wish to make Mr. Moston's acquaintance, and in accord with this feeling, no one in the Denning family had called on Mr. Moston or showed him the least courtesy. She thought the whole Rawdon family had the best reasons for feeling hurt at the neglect. This view of the case had not entered Mrs. Denning's mind. She was quickly sorry and apologetic for Dora's selfishness and her own thoughtlessness, and Ethel was not difficult to pacify. There was then no duty so imperative as the arrangement of a little dinner for Mr. Marston. We'll make it quite a family affair, said Mrs. Denning. Then we can go to the opera afterwards. Shall I call Mr. Marston at the Holland House? she asked anxiously. I will ask Bryce to call, said Dora. Bryce will do anything to please me now, mother. In this way, Bryce Denning's desires were all arranged for him, and that evening Dora made her request. Bryce heard it with a pronounced part of his lips, but finally told Dora she was irresistible, and as his time for pleasing her was nearly out, he would even call on the Englishman at her request. Mandy added, I think he is as proud as Lucifer, and I may get nothing for my civility, but the excuse of a previous engagement. But Bryce Denning expected much more than this, and he got all that he expected. The young man had common ground to meet on, and they quickly became as intimate as ever Frederick Moston permitted himself to be with a stranger. Bryce could hardly help catching enthusiasm from Moston on the subject of New York, and he was able to show his new acquaintance phases of life in the marvellous city, which were the greatest interest to the inquisitive Yorkshire squire. Chinese theatres and opium dives, German, Italian, Spanish, Jewish, French cities sheltering themselves within the great arms of the American city. Queer restaurants where could eat of the national dishes of every civilised country under the sun. Places of amusement, legal and illegal, and the vast underside of the evident life. All the uncared for toiling of the thousands who worked through the midnight hours. In these excursions, the young men became in a way familiar, though neither of them ever told the other real feelings of their hearts or the real aims of their lives. The proposed dinner took place ten days after its suggestion. There was nothing remarkable in the function itself. All millionaires have the same delicacies and the same wines and serve these things with precisely the same ceremonies. And as a general thing, the company follow rigidly ordained laws of conversation. Stories about public people, remarks about the weather and the opera are in order. But the original ideas or decided opinions are unpardonable sociable errors. Yet even these commonplace events may contain some element that shall unexpectedly cut a life in two, and so change its aims and desires as to virtually create a new character. It was Frederick Moston who in this instant underwent this great personal change, a change totally unexpected, and for which he was absolutely unprepared. For the people gathered in Mrs. Denning's drawing room were mostly known to him and the exceptions did not appear to possess any remarkable traits, except Basil Stanhope, who stood thoughtfully at a window, his pale lofty beauty wearing an air of expectation. Moston decided that he was naturally impatient for the presence of his fiancée, whose delayed entrance he perceived was also annoying Ethel. There was a slight movement, a sudden silence, and Moston saw Stanhope's face flush and turn magically radiant. Mechanically he followed his movement, and the next moment his eyes met fate and love slipped in between. Dora was there, a fairy-like vision in pale amber draperies, softened with silk lace. Diamonds were in her wonderfully waved hair and round her fair white neck. They clasped her belt and adorned the instep of her little amber silk slippers. She held a yellow rose in her hand, and yellow rosebuds lay among the lace at her bosom. 
and Mostyn, stupefied by her undreamed of loveliness, saw golden emanations from the clear pallor of her face. He felt for a moment or two as if he should certainly faint. Only by a miracle of stubborn will did he drag his consciousness from that golden-tinted, sparkling haze of beauty which had smitten him like an enchantment. Then the girl was looking at him with soft, dark gazelle eyes. She was even speaking to him, but what she said or what reply he made he could never by any means remember. Miss Bayard was to be his companion, and with some effort and a few indistinct words he gave his arm. She asked if he was ill, and when a shake of the head answered the query, she covered the few minutes of his disconcertion with her conversation. He looked at her gratefully and gathered his personality together, for love had come to him like a two-edged sword, dividing the flesh and the spirit, and he longed to cry aloud and relieve the sweet torture of the possession. Reaction, however, came quickly, and with it a wonderful access of all his powers. The sweet strong wine of love went to his brain like celestial nectar. All the witty amusing things he had ever heard came trooping into his memory, and the dinner was long delayed by his fine humour, his pleasant anecdotes, and the laughing thoughts which others caught up and illustrated in their own way. It was a feast full of good things, but its spirit was not able to bear transition. The company scattered quickly when it was over to the opera or theatre or to the rest of the quiet evening at home, for at the end enthusiasm of any kind has a chilling effect on the feelings. None of the party understood this result, and yet all were in some way affected by the sudden fall of mental temperature. Mr. Denning went to his library and took out his private ledger, a penitential sort of reading which he relished after moods of any kind of enjoyment. Mrs. Denning selected Ethel Rawdon for her text of disillusion. She thought Ethel had been a little too jealous of Dora's dress, and Dora said, it was one of her surprises, and Ethel thought she ought to know everything. You are too obedient to Ethel, continued Mrs. Denning, and Dora looked with a charming demureness at her lover and said, she had to be obedient to someone wiser than herself, and so slipped her hand into Basil's hand. And he understood the promise, and with a look of passionate affection, raised the little jeweled pledge and kissed it. Perhaps no one was more affected by this chill, critical after-hour than Miss Bayard and Ethel. Mostyn accompanied them home, but he was depressed, and his courtesy had the air of an obligation. He said he had a sudden headache and was not sorry when the ladies bid him good night on the threshold. Indeed, he felt that he must have refused any invitation to lengthen out the hours with them or anybody. He wanted one thing, and he wanted that with all his soul. Solitude, that he might fill it with images of Dora, and with passionate promises that either by fair means or foul, by right or wrong, he would win the bewitching woman for his wife. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes are released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe on whatever service you use so that you get your new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for tonight is Sweet Night and Friends by Kumiko. Check out more of their work on their website, which you'll find linked in the show notes. Good night, and sweet dreams. <laughs>